the UW-Madison faculty in 1994 after completing his PhD degree in atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington. He has earned recognition for his teaching, including the universe, uh, including Under Koffler Excellence in Teaching Award, which, by the way, is named in honor of a former Rotary member who spent his entire career at Align Energy. Professor Martin's research expertise is in mid-latitude weather systems, and he has authored over 50 scientific papers, as well as the leading textbook on mid-altitude atmospheric dynamics. In January, he was honored by the American Meteorolog Meteorological Society as its 2016 Edward N. Lorenz Teaching Excellence Award winner. Professor Martin will tell us about the nature and history of the famous late autumn storms in the Great Lakes states. We look forward to your presentation, Professor Martin, and have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polo Plus Fund by a way of saying thanks for speaking to us today. As most of you know, there will be, if there's time for questions at the end, there will be microphones that will float in the audience. And if you could just wait for one of those, um, because we are videoing the, um, the presentation today. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Jonathan Martin. Thank you very much, Michelle and, and Jane. And uh, I forget who it was. Carol maybe was the original invitee. Uh, for me to come here today. I'm really pleased to be here today on a somewhat stormy November day, but nothing like what we'll talk about a little bit here in the future. Um, what I want to do today is not only talk about some of these storms as phenomenological events, and uh, they're interesting just from that perspective, but also try and put them in the right um, context, physical context. So at the beginning of the presentation, there'll be a little bit of, of science about where these mid-latitude weather systems come from, these cyclones that get us and, um, and then a little bit of um, historiography of some of the really impressive storms that have occurred uh, in November in the last uh, century or so. So that's what I hope to do today. This picture on the opening slide is from the Waukegan Lighthouse. There's a million lighthouse pictures out there from the lakes. And um, it doesn't take too much wind to kick up 10 or 20 foot waves. And these are a little bigger than that. But I don't even think this is anything like what the storms uh, that we'll talk about would have been doing to the open sea. This is Lake Michigan. Lake Superior is even bigger because the fetch is so much more dramatic. Now we're going to test and see if this works from a distance. It does not seem to work. So if you can just hit the bottom arrow on the uh, far bottom left of the keyboard. That should do it, yeah, and, and this should go by itself for a while. Okay, so here you've got, this is a satellite mosaic that's made from um, infrared water vapor channel from a variety of different satellites out in space. And this is from last week, so this is very fresh, right off the presses. And yeah, I'm glad I'm hearing all the right uh, words, wow, and uh, things like this. <laughs> You're right, it should be wow. I'll say one thing very quickly, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is the home of satellite meteorology for the entire human civilization. So, yes. <laughs> And I'll also say this, such things as that don't happen by accident. Those are the result of long-term investments in education and research. That's all I'm going to say on that right now. <laughs> but what you can see, and I think you know what I mean, what you can see on that movie is spectacular. And I want you to keep watching it. You know, don't look at me. Listen and watch that. Because at first, I think the first time you see it, you think, well, this looks like the cream that I poured in my coffee cup barely organized chaos. But as it sinks in for a while, you start to see some patterns, even if it's the first time you've ever seen a global mosaic of satellite movies. For instance, you'll see a bunch of swirlies in both the southern and northern mid-latitude uh, uh, portions of the globe, so across North America and Europe, and then across Central South America and Southern Africa, for instance. And those swirlies are all moving from west to east. Whereas the uh, kind of clumps of clouds that look almost more like cauliflower or potatoes, piles of mashed potatoes at the tropical latitudes, right in the middle of the band uh, of the image, are going generally from east to west. So there's some broad scale order that you can see immediately out of all of that. Now what we're going to talk about today are the swirlies in the middle latitudes, particularly some that affect northern mid-latitude locations like the Great Lakes states. But all of those have certain characteristics that are fundamental and can be described in, in precise physical terms. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but not in great detail. But this is a really spectacularly chaotic yet orderly globe that we live on. 
And I think it's really pretty neat to see this and let it just sink in for a while and um, enjoy, the, enjoy the picture. So can we go to the next slide? I'm sorry, we're going to have to do it this way. This is a picture of the Earth, a schematic picture of the Earth being showered by radiation from the sun. Those beams of radiation in the schematic are all parallel to each other because we're so far away from the sun that even though it's a spherical object radiating in every direction, we're so far away that the radiation emitted by the sun that intercepts us hits us as if it were just a flat plane um, sending radiation our way. So it's parallel beam radiation. The Earth's axis, the stake that goes through the northern and southern poles, and it's in red in this picture, is tilted uh, towards that radiation at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. And in the winter time for the northern hemisphere, which is what, what I've depicted here, the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. In the summertime for us, the North Pole is tilted towards it and it's opposite for the southern hemisphere. Can we keep on going? Now, the spherical, no, we need to go back a slide. Okay. The spherical shape of the Earth, of course, results in the fact that that radiation coming at us in parallel beams is unevenly absorbed across the surface of the planet in its atmosphere. And, it's, and it has a seasonal variation because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. So there's a long kind of argument we could make about how we have seasonal variations, but this really lies at the core of it. And the next slide will tell us that if you have an uneven distribution of heating across the planet, you're going to have certain latitudes where in, during the course of a single year, from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south, more radiation is absorbed at the surface of the Earth than in, in the form of short wave radiation, then is radiated back away from the surface in the form of longer wave radiation, the kind you and I are emitting toward each other right now. We're all doing it. So there's a tremendous amount of radiation emission going on in here. Um, so, yeah, true, yeah, it's radiating. And then at the high latitudes, you notice that there's more irradiance coming away from the surface of the planet than there is absorption calculated over the whole portion of the year. So the tropical latitudes uh, run an annual surplus of radiant of energy, the high latitudes run an annual deficit. And yet, we don't see the high latitudes getting systematically colder every year. We don't see the tropical latitudes getting systematically warmer every year as in comparison. So there has to be, the next slide will show, there has to be a distribution of radiation, and then the next slide too. Um, surplus of energy has to be, we gotta go back one. Rats. Surplus of energy from the tropics has to be exported to the high latitudes in order that we don't systematically bake at the, lati uh, at the tropics and, and freeze at the poles. And there's three main ways that that's done in the Earth atmosphere system and ocean system. One of them is ocean currents. Water is heated in the tropics and then moves poleward in both hemispheres uh, in ocean currents. Carries a tremendous amount of that heat, that surplus heat to high latitudes. That's one way. Another way is water. The substance water is the only substance in our atmosphere that can exist in all three phases. And I always tell my students in 100, which I teach in the spring here at Wisconsin, and I, we usually start the third week of January, and I tell them, when we get to talking about some of this stuff in a physical term, you'll never ever look at a slush puddle the same again. Because <laughs> it's the only chemical on Earth that can be water, solid, and vapor at the same time in our atmosphere. And there's no other chemical that can do that. So water is a really ingenious little invention for our planet. You evaporate water through the surplus of energy in the, in the low latitudes. Most of the low latitudes of Earth are water. And then that water in the invisible gas phase is exported poleward, and it's condensed. And that's where the heat's released again. What a great trick. But the best trick is mid-latitude cyclones and anticyclones. And I'll show you what's going on with them. So if we can go to the next slide. Mid-latitude cyclones are regions where the pressure at sea level is lower than anywhere in its immediate vicinity. So they're low pressure regions is another way to describe them. Air converges into the center of these regions of low pressure, as I've drawn in that schematic. And when the air converges towards a central point with a solid boundary underneath it, there's no place else it can go when it gets to that central point except straight up. So that's what I'll show in the next slide, an updraft of air. And when the air is forced to rise, it rises toward pressures that are lower, and it expands into that lower pressure environment, and it has to cool as a consequence because it pushes against its environment. It does work against it. And the relative humidity of the air increases whenever it cools down. And it can increase to the point where it's 100%, and that water vapor, which is invisible, suddenly becomes visible in the form of cloud droplets, which can in turn uh, engender the production of precipitation-sized particles. So it's low pressure regions by virtue of that line of argument that lead to the production of clouds and precipitation. And there's one, one more thing I want to say on the slide, the next slide, and that is that the rising air in that column in green also takes mass out of the column under which sits that L. 
And so that column of air weighs less and less and less if you can make that air, some of that air get out of it. That's how you lower the pressure at the surface. When I was a senior in high school, a junior in high school, and I first had my first physics class, and this was one of my really um, uh, great experiences, uh, tremendously influential mentor who I had for physics in high school, and I asked him one time, I said, Brother Sullivan, how come you can have lower pressure at one spot over the continental US and higher pressure at the surface somewhere else. I was interested in the weather from an early age. And he said, I'm not so sure about that, but let's think about what it means. Pressure is force or weight divided by area. That's the formal definition of it. And he said, doesn't that mean then that the column of air over the low pressure column has to have less mass in it? Yeah, it does. How do you rearrange it? He said, that's for college. <laughs> And that was, a, that was a great answer. That was a great answer. And I'm still thinking about it today. I just had a meeting this morning with a, with a sophomore undergrad. She wants to do research with me. I said, let's think about this problem. How do we move the mass around in the atmosphere? Same exact problem 35 years downstream. Awesome. <laughs> Next slide, please. The opposite of cyclones are anti-cyclones. And they are regions of high pressure at the surface. And the air tends to diverge out from the center of these things, these regions of high pressure. And as a consequence, well, I shouldn't say as a consequence, but connected to that is the next slide will show the air is moving downward towards the center of such disturbances. And so the sinking air is getting compressed as it rises to higher pressure. Now it moves to higher pressure, and then as it warms up through compression, its relative humidity goes down, and the skies are generally clear in association with anticyclones. So there's a reason why that's the case. It's also true, as the next slide will show, that that sinking air is actually a manifestation of the stuffing of extra air into that column. And that means it becomes more massive, and it weighs more, so that its pressure at the bottom registers a higher value. So that's how you have high and low pressure systems. They also have circulations horizontally around them, which the next slide will begin to indicate. Uh, here's a schematic that indicates that this train of lows and highs, this is where we start to get back to the satellite picture, the train of lows and highs, the swirlies that you saw in the satellite picture, occur in the middle latitudes. And the middle latitudes are characterized by colder air towards the pole in our hemisphere to the north, warmer air to the south toward the equator. Now, if the next slide will show the circulation around regions of low pressure in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise, nearly everybody's heard that or knows that. And then the circulation on the next slide around anticyclones is clockwise, and they occur in sequence, just as I've drawn them. Not always as obviously as I've drawn them, but always in some kind of a sequence like that, one after the other. Now, think about the space between the region of low pressure on the far left and the next downstream high. The wind in between those two is going to be straight from the south to the north. Then the wind between the first anticyclone and the next downstream low pressure center is going to be straight from the north. Let's go to the next slide and indicate that. See? You get southerly winds between the low and the high, northerly winds between the high and the low, southerly winds again between the next low and the high. What's that doing? It's pumping cold air equatorward, where it will be warmed up by the surplus of energy. And it's pumping warm air forward, where it will be cooled off and relax the deficit. Mid-latitude cyclones. I told you there were three, right? And I only mentioned two so far. My storms are the ones that do the most work in alleviating that surplus deficit. And so that's one of the cool things about them. They are a huge player in, in making the Earth a habitable planet. They ventilate the tropics, and they, and they warm the high latitudes. So here's another thing to think about with respect to mid-latitude storms. Again, cold and warm. And the red lines are measures of temperature, some sort of isotherms, lines of constant temperature. The next slide will show that as a consequence of this horizontal temperature contrast, it's a north-south contrast in temperature, locally there are regions of really high wind speeds at the top of the troposphere, about six or so miles above the ground. And those things are called jets. Probably everybody's heard about the jet stream. And they're really there. Now, it's, you don't just go to six miles and look around, and you're guaranteed to be in one of these jet streaks. But most of the time in the mid-latitudes, you won't be very far from one. They do have horizontal boundaries, like I've tried to show here, the ends of the football. It, it, it turns out that there are characteristic up and down drafts of air that are associated with this structure. The next slide will show where the characteristic rising air is in association with the jet stream. There's an entrance region to the jet on the left. There's an exit region on the right. And so you can say the right entrance region of the jet is a region where the air tends to rise. The left exit region of the jet is a region where the air tends to rise. And then the next slide will show corresponding regions of subsidence, the left entrance region and the right exit region. These things get deformed, and they don't look like this beautiful little schematic all the time. But son of a gun, when you apply the most intensely analytical tools to real weather systems, you find this picture in one way, shape, or form every time. 
So the next thing I want to show you is that we have to, we're talking about cyclones in November. So we need to figure out where is the air rising characteristically. Here's what the weather maps look like away from the ground. They're just big open waves. And really, they look just like the waves you drew as a kindergarten kid when you were told to tell you know, the teacher about your trip to the beach in the summertime. You draw waves, and they look exactly the same. This is a plan view, so it's north, south, east, west. And then at the next slide, we'll show the jet is sometimes embedded on the, on the western side of one of these troughs in the waves. And then if we superimpose one of the regions of ascent, which is on the left exit region of the jet, that's where your regions of low pressure are going to develop. So, and this is exactly what we see day to day in weather maps, okay? So we know where these things come from. They arise from the fact that the Earth is spherical, that it's colder at high latitudes and warmer at low latitudes, and all of those ingredients lead to the waves in the flow, and the waves in the flow produce the cyclones. You might be wondering what's so special about November. Here's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, in November, we're already six weeks right now past the equinox. So it, the sun's been down at the North Pole for six weeks. It gets colder and colder and colder the longer the night lasts. And in this case, it's a six week long night. It's got several more weeks to go before it finally, uh, the sun comes up. In fact, it's got several months to go. It won't come up at the North Pole till March 21st. So it gets systematically colder as the days wear on. That means colder and colder air starts to filter southward. And if you remember the picture that I showed that helps to spawn the jet, which in turn spawns the cyclones and so on, that jet its intensity depends on how strong the temperature contrast is. So the colder it gets to the north, the stronger the jet gets. As we head into November, we start to have really vigorous upper level jet systems that are part of the development picture of cyclones. Not only that, here in the Great Lakes states, we've had a long summer, most years, of filling the lakes with radiation from the sun, warming them up. So the water is still warm. The ice is not on the lakes yet in early November. So we have a really warm underlying surface. And we're dragging these sort of polar air masses and weather systems in middle and upper levels over regions of the surface of the planet that are really liable to help in the development of storm systems. There's a lot of water to be evaporated. There's a lot of warmth in the water to help drive the, the intensity of these storms. So November is a special time of year around here. And the lakes are a really big part of that special time of the year. So now, with that background, let's take a look at some of the famous storms. Ah, I've got to say one last thing. And that's this picture, because it will have an impact on the first one I talk about. So this is how you can imagine the distribution of temperatures around an individual cyclone, which is a region of low pressure. I've also placed on this, on this diagram a red line indicating the warm front. You've probably heard about fronts with respect to storms. And then the cold front trailing to the south and west. And then you have the idea that the flow is counterclockwise around that. Warm air rushing poleward on the eastern side, cold air rushing equatorward on the western side. Sometimes these storms have extremely strong contrasts of warm and cold across the cold front. Other times, they're not so intense. The one we just had this morning that kind of came through with, a, with that little bit of thunder, not such an extreme frontal passage. In fact, it's now going to move back forward, and we're going to end up being warmer the next couple of days than we are today. But sometimes you get extraordinarily strong contrasts in temperature across the cold front, so strong that they spawn really intense kinds of weather and strong variations in that weather. That's what we're going to start to talk about with respect to these storms. Here's a map from November 11th, 1911. It's just uh, surface temperatures. And in fact, it shows the surface high temperatures. You might be able to see the little triangle, the little star that I've put on top of Janesville. Janesville had a high temperature that day of nearly 70 degrees, as the map indicates, just like yesterday. Okay, it's exactly the same kind of day in Wisconsin as yesterday was. The difference is the extent and extremity of the cold air lingering uh, or just looming to our northwest on this day is much more extreme than yesterday. And so let's go to the next slide, please. These are the low temperatures for the same day. And if you can find Janesville again, you find low temperatures in the mid-20s. This is an unbelievable event that occurred on November 11th, 1911, tied to a really intense mid-latitude storm. And I'm highlighting the frontal passage in this case. Let's look at some other characteristics of this. We'll go to the next slide. And that shows, I, maybe you can't see this. I was hoping you'd be able to read some of it. And even, I was hoping I'd be able to read some of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did highlight some of it. And, and I sent the slides this morning to Jane. So you'll be able to see some of this stuff. But there were temperature drops as much as 35 degrees in one hour at some of these stations. St. Louis had one like that. I think Kansas City, it was a little bit longer. It was 78 at noon and 11 degrees 
uh, above zero sometime, some 14 hours later. So incredible temperature drops, okay, really unbelievable. In Chicago, the thing I've highlighted in yellow, I can remember the story now, um, there was somebody working on the railroad who died of heat prostration that day. Early in the morning on the 11th, it was over 72 degrees in Chicago. And then somebody on the railroad died from exposure the same night, froze to death. Unbelievable, in one day. Okay, so this is just exceptional. And it's all up and down the whole Central Plains states as this Great Lakes cyclone went roaring into southern, southwestern Ontario. So really an unbelievable event. Let's go to the next slide. Let's get even better. This is tornadoes that occurred on the 11th of November 1911. And by their Fujita scale ranking, so the ranking goes from uh, 0 to 5, there actually is a category for an F6, which is described as inconceivably strong. We've never actually decided to give a single tornadic event an F6 rating. But F5 takes freight trains off the track, uh, leaves no foundation at all to a home, leaves no trace of a home uh, if it comes over it. F4 is darn close to that, okay? And that's what happened in Janesville on the 11th of November, 1911. Warm temperatures in the morning, front comes through with severe weather associated with it, an F4 tornado, parts of the town were in ruins. Let's keep on going, please. Death and injured strewn in swath of terrific storm. Look at how they wrote about these things in 1911. It's really before the modern era of meteorolog meteorological science. Hurricane sweeps the states. It was not a hurricane. I mean, by, really. But it was a, a furious storm, and so that word was used with sort of abandon in the uh, days before we really started to become a, 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 an honest branch of physics, which we are certainly now. Uh, well, it, you know, it's really true. And President Grant was the one who started the National Weather Service called the U.S. Weather Bureau Signal Service in 1870. So Grant gets a bad reputation for being, you know, all sorts of bad things when he was in Oval Office, but boy, did he do a smart thing there. And that came right out of his experience in the, in the war. So uh, in Janesville, those aiding the grim tornado recovery work toiled in blizzard conditions. Janesville had an F4 tornado in the morning or afternoon of the 11th, six inches of snow on the, in the evening, same day. Unbelievable. And there's no other time of the year where that happens uh, except November. So really exciting, but <laughs> tragic. <laughs> well, you know, I give myself away, don't I? I, I <laughs> I, when I was, uh, when I was a, uh, a senior in college, I was flying home to, to try and intercept Hurricane Gloria. I grew up in Massachusetts, if you didn't know. Um, and, <laughs> you know, don't worry, I won't hold your accent against you. And um, so I'm at the airport, and this was right after, you might recall this, the Mexico City earthquake in September of 1985. So there's two people across from me, and, they, and they we're waiting for the plane, and one of them's got glasses down like this. He's kind of an older guy. And uh, the other one's, a, you know, a younger lady, and we're talking. And uh, she says, so why are you going to Boston? I said, well, I want to try and intercept the hurricane. This guy shut his book, put his glasses down like this, and he looked at me. I suppose you're off to Mexico City next. You know, <laughs> thinks I'm a global disaster, uh, you know, um, chaser or something. I just like the weather. Here's another storm. November of 1913, the White Hurricane, it was called. Okay, just two years later, two years later, lots of people saw both of these storms. Okay, four out of the five Great Lakes lost ships on this, in this event. And 19 total ships, 250 sailors died. So this is one of the threats that these storms bring to our region of the globe, and really pretty unbelievable. It's, it still stands as the most destructive natural disaster ever to hit the Great Lakes, the White Hurricane of 1913. So the word hurricaning, it's not a hurricane. But here's a surface weather map from 8 o'clock in the morning on Friday. And the day later, so it's warm again in Madison and much of the state on, on uh, Friday. Then it's bitterly cold the next day because the storm is pretty intense and the front was really intense again, but not quite to the extent of 1911. And then we can keep on going. There's a secondary storm that's developing along the Georgia, South Carolina coast by 8 p.m. Saturday, and we can keep on going. They kind of merge into one storm at 8 a.m., uh, approximately on November 9th. The pressure at the center of that is down to 988 millibars, which is way below the standard sea level pressure. So that's an intense storm. That's the kind that gets you excited, if you're me. Then 12 hours later, 974. Now look at where the center of the disturbance is. Uh, on uh, 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, it's somewhere down near you know, Western Virginia. By the time you get to 8 p.m. Sunday, it's retrograded. It's gone to the west. It's moved east to west towards, I don't know, maybe Cincinnati. And the isobars, the lines of constant pressure that are drawn on these maps, they, the tighter they are horizontally spaced, the stronger the winds. So as this storm got more and more intense, 
and they tend to have their strongest winds on the northwest side. As this thing encroached again upon the Great Lakes from the east, it brought incredibly strong winds, and that's where most of the sailors and ships went down, was on Sunday the 9th uh, of November. And then by the time we got to Monday morning, the storm was even more intense and sitting just about at the latitude of, of uh, Green Bay, but a little bit further to the east, so maybe over the thumb of Michigan, right on the southern part of Lake Huron at this time. 972 millibars, way below standard sea level pressure. In fact, 4% below the average sea level pressure. And you're going to say, 4%? Who worries about 4%? The atmosphere really responds to 4% mass reduction. And the, look at this next slide. We'll go to the next one, too. I should have put them on the same one. This is the maximum wave heights on the lakes at the time of almost nearly the most intense time. And look at that south portion of Lake Huron. Maximum wave heights, I think, were in the, were in the range of 45 feet. Okay, Just unbelievable, 45 feet. And I think I'm right about this. Maximum wave height means from the level to the crest, not from the trough to the crest. So it's really 90 feet of water that you're looking at when you're going up and down. 90 feet of water. Peak to trough. Yeah, peak to trough. Unbelievable. Okay, So remarkable. Uh, an incredible storm. Then you maybe have heard about the Armistice Day storm of November uh, 7th through 11th of 1940. Some great stories come out of this, many of them tragic, unfortunately. One of them on the front end, this is a, this is a position of the Surface Low Pressure Center associated with the Armistice Day storm um, all the way from the west coast to when it got into central Ontario. Now, you notice the track goes from uh, western, uh, eastern Washington southeastward towards the panhandles of Texas and Oklahoma. And this is a storm of a variety, anyway, the, the storm track of a variety known as panhandle hookers. And it's not meant to suggest anything morally casual about that part of the country, <laughs> but instead that the storms hook when they get to the panhandles and then head back up to the north and east. And then on the, si on the right side of the uh, second part of that diagram, you can see the sea level pressures are really low in the 970s, so you already know that gets me excited. This storm, when it was coming on shore in the Pacific Northwest, came on shore on the 7th of November, which was exactly the day where they were opening up the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And you've seen the movie of Galloping Gertie, right? When the bridge resonates with the, with the strong winds through the gap and it just breaks apart, that was this storm. That was the first thing that this storm did to our country, but it wasn't the last. So it's pretty unbelievable. So let's um, go to the next slide. Well, first we'll go back to that one. You can kind of see that this was mostly a November 11th event for um, the, the Great Lakes state. So we'll go to the next slide. This was um, November 11th, 1940 at 12 in the afternoon. It was a Monday. And the weather on the weekend had been very warm in, 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 in advance of this, much like we had the last couple of days. Lots of people took Monday off and decided, you know, let's, let's extend our duck hunting, let's extend our fishing, extend our outdoor activities. So there were a lot of people, especially in Minnesota. You can see that the storm was centered about at La Crosse at this time. So on the western side of the storm is where the winds are strongest and it's coldest, and that's in Minnesota. Didn't start the day that way, but it ended up like that. And there were people hunting along the Mississippi duck hunting and um, suddenly they, you know, the water was freezing right around them. They had to find shelter, and some of them built shelters on islands and so on. Quite a number of people died of exposure that day by the time it was over. In fact, there were 49 deaths in Minnesota, more, almost half of them, something in the low 20s, were hunters that were exposed with no remedy uh, because it came on so quickly. And the storm here was at 973 millibars. There were uh, lots of ships that went down again in this storm. Uh, 145 people died in total in this event. Um, in Watkins, Minnesota, two people died uh, because trains couldn't see each other in the blizzard conditions. So you not only have heavy snow falling, but you also have winds that are blowing it around. So the visibility was zero. Trains collided. Uh, three ships were lost in Michigan, Lake Michigan. 66 sailors died. And there were 27 inches of snow piled up in Collegeville, Minnesota, which is just a little to the west of um, St. Cloud. So let's go to the next slide. Here's a picture from Watkins. It almost looks like something out of, you know, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, that scene where they're in the snowstorm. I mean, it even has that kind of fuzzy look to it. It's really remarkable. They got 22 inches of snow, I think, in Watkins, Minnesota. And then the next slide has a young lady digging her car out outside Minneapolis, which had about 14 inches of snow. And of course, the winds were so extreme that that snow is going to be blown around and drifted with ease. And so it didn't look, you know, you didn't get five feet of snow, but you had six foot drifts in many places in Minnesota, even all the way to Minneapolis. And then the next slide shows 
not a not a very good um, recollection of, of the heaviest snows. It was much stronger than this in certain locations. But you can see the main band goes from just to the southeast of the Lake of the Woods down to, you know, Winona or something like that, where you're talking about more than a foot of snow in the early part of November. So a pretty unbelievable event. Let's go next to the famous Edmund Fitzgerald storm, which I'm only going to show you the second half of the evolution of this one, but you'll see that it looks a lot like the one I just talked about, the November 11th, 1940 Armistice Day storm. Look where the storm starts on the morning of November 9th, 1975. It's a weak cyclone in southern Kansas, 1,000 millibars. There's nothing to write home about. Warm front extends out to the east over the southern Great Lakes, Minnesota. I mean, Wisconsin is a little bit poleward of the warm front, so we probably had a chilly morning, rather like today, I bet, um, as the day dawned. Then let's go to the next slide. This is 12 hours later. The cyclone's deepened by about seven or so millibars. You know, it's maybe attention-grabbing, but not the kind that makes you say batten down the hatches. Looking pretty good for a cyclone. Maybe it's going to be a, kind of a breezy, blustery day in southern Wisconsin, southwestern Wisconsin. This is 7 p.m. on the 9th. And then the next one is uh, 7 a.m. on the 10th. And I believe it was at about this time that the ship uh, really was, was going uh, into trouble. If we can go back to the prior slide, this is about the time they were kind of planning their trip, which I think went all the way from like Superior, and they were heading to Whitefish Bay, um, Michigan, or Ontario. I forget exactly where, but all the way along the, the whole length of the main axis of Lake Superior. So they started out sometime late in the day on the 9th. And then the next slide again, thank you. Um, then you've got the storm revved up to 983 millibars. Again, solid lines here are the isobars. The closer they are together in the horizontal, the stronger the winds. The winds are raking Lake Superior at this time. And Lake Superior is gigantic, as you know. And it's going to, it's going to turn these, uh, the, the surface water into a huge cauldron of waves. So let's go to the next slide. Here's peak wind gusts, or steady winds, 45 knots in the southeast part of Lake Superior. Next slide. Maximum wave heights. 40 feet. So you're, again, you're looking at about sort of an 80-foot sea, really, when you're out there. And this is a big ship, but it's not big enough to deal with that. And we all know the tragedy that ensued. So a really bad storm. And I think I'm almost at the end. I've got a couple more slides here. This is now one from the mo more modern era that, era that occurred in November of 1998. Beautiful satellite picture of this thing. Look at how gorgeous that is. Is it any wonder that people who study the weather get fascinated by it, almost like little kids? Really. <laughs> It's hard not to. If you have it, well, you know, I don't think I know anybody who likes weather systems and has grown into that affection as an adult. You're all captivated. We're all captivated as young kids. And almost all of us had paper roots. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. This will be a series of three. This cyclone started out at 994, 7 p.m. on the 9th. Go to the next one, please. 980, this is really intense development. Then uh, 12, nine hours after this, we're down to 964. So one. 0.5% of the atmospheric mass has disappeared from the column over that storm in nine hours. That's an incredibly rapid intensification rate, and it's occurring over the land, where it doesn't have any of the benefit of warm oceans or anything like that. Incredible. Okay? And this was a really disastrous storm. Much better forecasted than 1975. Again, a testimony to the power of investment in research and development. Let's um, go to the next two slides. We had one that almost made it into November not long ago, 26th of, November, of October 2010. This is 3.30 in the afternoon. Lowest sea level pressure ever recorded over land in North America associated with this storm. The last slide comes up next. We had a sea level pressure down into the mid-950s. You can even tell, without even use any sort of inflection, you'd still know that's a lot less than 970s. And we had maximum wind gusts, non-thunderstorm wind gusts, routinely over 50 miles per hour, many places 70. Madison had a 71 mile per hour wind gust on this day. And then the purple is a squall line, the snow up in Minnesota. This was an incredible event late October. Beneficiary of the same kind of unusual circumstances that do come to bear in this region of the world in uh, late October and much of November. So the next 10 days here, however, we're going to break an all-time record, it looks like. We will have the latest first frost in Madison's history if we can get past November 12th. So uh, we're guaranteed to be the second latest. There's a question of whether or not we'll get to the 12th or the 13th. If we get to the 13th, the third warm record of the year uh, of really significant note. So things are changing, but this kind of thing is still a threat in this month. So I thank you for your attention, and I take any questions. I'm happy to answer your questions.
could, uh, could, uh, could you tell us a little bit yeah. about map drawing, how that has evolved over the last century from what was probably hand drawn to computer generated drawings? Yeah, uh, I'll do that. And uh, I just want to announce, too, if, if any of you have questions, this has to be the only question, I'm afraid, but I, I'll hang around and ask, answer any other ones. Um, map drawing, still, the best way to do it is to get a pencil out and draw it on top of that data because you get a familiarity with what the data is telling you that you can't get if you rely on some objective way to do it with a computer. There are times where plotting the data by the computer is a huge advantage. It saves you a tremendous amount of time. In the old days, uh, you had to actually plot all the stations by hand and then analyze them, and that would take you several hours to do one map. Now all I have to do is do the analysis. But I'm happy to do it because it leads me to understand what's going on better than I would if I were just given some you know, answer from the computer. Although in a, an operational setting, like in the weather service, I think they take advantage of the fact that the computer can give them a guess of the plot, uh, of the analysis. And then I think the really good weather service person is still taking a pencil to that and saying, what is it really like in my region? Let me fill this in with my own sense of how the weather works and, and paying closer attention to the observations. So that's changed a little bit. And, then, and that might be a case where automation actually pulls us further away from uh, the process by which the right answer can come out of the process. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>